Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India I am Dr. Priyanka Singh, Assistant Professor, Department of Political Science, DAV PG College, Varanasi. And today, I will be discussing on the topic Social Constructivism and Feminism in International Relations. This is my fifth lecture. In the first lecture, I discussed on the topic Emergence of International Relations as an academic discipline. In the second lecture, I taught about realism, the theory of realism. In the third lecture, I taught about the theory of liberalism and in the fourth lecture, I talked about the theory of Marxism in international relations. And today, I will be discussing on social constructivism and then feminism in international relations. To begin with, social constructivism first. Social constructivism. There are two words, social and constructivism. The arrival of social constructivism in international relations is often associated with the end of Cold War. With the end of the Cold War, the world witnessed many changes in international relations. So, there was change in the theory also. So, many apart from the mainstream theories, social constructivism also emerged as an important theory, important perspective. And mainly there was one reason and that was the end of the Cold War because the traditional theories that were existing that is realism, liberalism, these theories failed to explain the end of the Cold War, the phenomena of the end of the Cold War because the basic focus of these theories were states and institutions. Actually, the problem was that both these theories focused on state and institutions without any consideration for human nature, without any consideration for individuals. Although classical realism talks about human nature, but that is in terms of the how this nature is affecting the nature of the state. So, the importance of the individual, their thinking, their way of working, these things did not get due respect in the mainstream theories. There was no scope for individuals and whatever their actions were, they did not get due consideration. So, social constructivists basically argue that the end of the Cold War, the reason for which we did not got explanation by realism and liberalism. So, they say that the end of the Cold War was the result of the action of people, not the action of states or international organizations. So, it is the people, those who, whom the credit for the end of the Cold War goes, not the states and international organizations. Coming to the major theoretical proposition by the social constructivism. So, social constructivism 
basically argues that international relations are socially constructed. They are not something which is pre-given. They are not something natural. They are socially constructed and as they are socially constructed, they are imbued with social values, norms and assumptions. Whose social values, norms and assumptions? The social values, norms and assumptions of the individual. Those individual, those who did not get due respect in other theories. So, social constructivism believe that there is no objective social and political reality independent of our understanding of it. Nothing is pre-given, nothing is pre-decided. They believe that it is the people that construct the world in which they live. And according to those constructions, when their assumptions, their social values, their norms, their ideas get wide recognition, wide acceptance, they become significant, they become the ultimate norm, they become the conventions. So, everything is constructed, nothing is natural. So, they say that okay, states are the main factors in international relations, but the structure of international relations is based on social theory and norms rather than the material. That material that was emphasized in the theory of Marxism. So, as per social constructivist, they say that states and their interests are important part of the structure of international relations. And thus, constructivists dispute the idea that these structures are necessary, fixed or having inherent meaning. They are not fixed, they are not necessary, they can change. So, they believe that neither object nor concept have any necessary, fixed or objective meaning. Rather, their meanings are constructed, they are built. How? Through social interaction. In other words, we can say that it is the individual, it is the human that provide meaning to object, not the object that provide meaning to individual. This is wrong. It is an individual that provide meaning to object. So, it is not the other way around, object will not provide meaning to the individual, individual will provide meaning to the object. So, when a child is born, we give him or her certain name. So, after that, we identify that individual with that particular name. For example, we give name Sham to any boy. If his name would have been Ram, that is also acceptable. So, who is giving that identity? It is the individual who is giving the identity. And after that, we understand that, okay, it is the identity through which that individual gets recognized. But ultimately, we gave that identity to that individual. So, according to social constructivist, we never look at the world through naked eyes. How we look at the world? Through the glass of culture, norm, value, identities, etc. And these culture, norms, values, identity shape the further relations, 
shape the international politics. So, ultimately in international politics, the belief of the leaders, the elite class, their identity, their social norm all shape the conduct of the state. It does, state does not behave by itself. There is always the effect of the personality who is in power. That is why if one party comes to the power, his or her alienation is different, the other party come to the power, their alienation is different and as per their alienation, the states act. So, can we say that it is the state that is taking decision? No, it is the individual that is taking decision. So, if you believe the principle of realism or liberalism, realism say that okay, state is important, statism survival and self-help. So, is the state that is ensuring its the security of its border? Is the state that is ensuring its survival through self-help? It is the individual who is doing that on behalf of the state. If you talk about in terms of the principles of liberalism, liberalism says that it is the institutions who can bring peace in the world. Does, does that institution act by itself? No, it is the individual that is taking decision, sitting in that particular position, whatever position he or she is sitting. So, reality is always under construction. What is real? That the thing which is constructed. So, if anything is constructed, it can be changed also. It is not something which is natural that cannot be changed. Okay, the sun rises in the east and set in the west, that can't be changed. But any artificial creation can get changed. What social constructivism actually says? They say that all the identity, norms, values, they all are created, so they can change. If we give meaning to any particular thing, they are not fixed, they can change over time. As per the change in the ideas, change in our belief system. So, an important part of social constructivism is that learning is built from the knowledge that people already possess about the world. When the child is born, he or she get certain knowledge, he recognizes his or her mother, father, other family members, the society. So, these meanings he or she learns with the passage of the time. But are, can we say that these identities are fixed? They can change because that meaning, that identity is given by us. A person can have different identities depending upon different situations. I can be a wife, a daughter, a sister. So, I am the same person, but my identity keeps on changing depending upon the situation. So, can I say that it is fixed? It, if it is fixed, how can it change? Now, another central issue to constructivism is identity and interest. All these identities are given from the perspective of interest. The state can have multiple identities, like a person can have multiple identities. And those identities are socially constructed. Though they are socially constructed through interaction with other actors. 
I can have different kind of relation with Pakistan and India can have different kind of relation with USA, a different kind of relation with Bangladesh. So India is the same, but its relation with all these countries differ. How they differ? Because it has multiple identities and these identities are constructed through interaction. So as soon as if I cite the example of Bangladesh, there is the, the Prime Minister currently is Sheikh Hasina. So India and Bangladesh relations are very good. But as soon as the government will change, suppose when Khalida Zia will come into the power, can will we have the same relationship? same cordial relationship that we are sharing now? No, it will change because it will depend upon the inclination of the government. So India is also the same, Bangladesh is also the same but that relation will change. How that will change? Because individuals will change, the leaders will change. And every leader is having their own perspective. So identities are representation of an actor's understanding of who they are and that will signal their interest. So they are important to constructivists as they argue that identities constitute interest and action. Now coming to the evolution of the concept of social constructivism. This term social constructivism was first coined by Nicholas Onuf in 1989 in his book The World of Our Making. So in this book he put forward the idea that nation states like individuals live in reality primarily formed by themselves rather than the outside material entities. We are not made but constructed by our social and cultural relation with others. And uh, interstate interactions, associations form their identities and they, these identities in turn will inform the structure and institutions. When we talk about social constructivism and international relations, social constructivism believe that international relation is human invention. It is not something natural, it is man-made. So these relations are constituted by ideas not the material forces, what Marxism claims. So the set of ideas, body of thought, system of norms and perceptions, all these things have their effect on international relations. Because all these ideas, body of thought, system of norms, values, they are created by some people at some particular place, at some particular time. And that is the reason that it is created by some people at some particular time. It is not permanent in nature and it can get replaced when new ideas will form. Now coming to the contribution of Alexander Wendt. Alexander Wendt argues that the nature of international relations depend upon how states deal with it. So as per his view, constructivism wants to make a balance between neorealism and neoliberalism because neorealism believe that the logic of anarchy is the process that leads to cooperation. It is to come out of that anarchy, what we do? 
we tend to cooperate so that we can get rid of the anarchy whereas neo liberals argue that the logic of anarchy is structural and leads to conflict and as per went constructivism tries to make a balance between neo realism and neo liberalism because constructivism believes that the logic of anarchy is how states think and behave in his seminal essay anarchy is what states make of it the social construction of power politics alexander went explains that the constructed nature of anarchy so went basically highlights the importance of shared ideas knowledge in international relationship now as we we have got certain perspective because our socialization has been that okay the nature of usa is this the nature of israel is this the nature of pakistan is this but suppose if any alien came come from any other planet where he is having no knowledge about the behavior of the states how that particular state behaves so think of it that will he be able to look at the world the way we look no his perspective will be different because he has no prior information regarding the behavior of the states that how they are behaving with each other and what this alien example is cited by alexander went alexander went points out that the structures of human association are determined primarily by the sheer ideas rather than material forces so all this structure is shaped by the ideas no role of material forces thus went argues that international relations are made socially rather than historically they are going in completely different direction from marxism as well as realism and liberalism because they also say that self help is not a necessary feature of anarchy and the same about the neo liberals that they claim that the nature of cooperation in international relations social constructivities completely vary from the perspective of realism and liberalism and marxism so we can say that the discipline of international relations benefit from constructivism because they offer a different perspective from the mainstream theories and thus they address the concept and issues that was neglected by the mainstream theories because constructivist offer a alternative explanation and insight for the events that are occurring in the social world they prove that it is not the distribution of the material power wealth and geographical condition that can only explain the state behavior there is also the role of ideas identities norms values and these ideas identities norms and values were ignored by the mainstream theories further some so there the focus of social constructivism on ideational factor shows that reality is not fixed rather reality is subject to change as per the changing condition the social constructivism places a strong emphasis on problem solving and constructing new ways of thinking and encourages collaboration so being a new theory because it originated since the end of the cold war 
but it has secured its place in the field of international relations because they offer us a different perspective to look at the world. This is about social constructivism. Now we will move to feminism in international relations. The theory of feminism in international relations. So the first thing when we talk about feminism in international relations is that the field of international relations, the study of international politics has traditionally been the gender blind. They have not given due importance to females, women because the main focus of the theory of international relations has been on states and inter-state relations. So when we talk about states and inter-state relations, the, we just neglect the role of women. So sexual politics and gender relations appear to be of no relevance in the field of international relations. So after the end of the World War II, the global order rapidly started changing and this global order was witnessing new issues and new challenges. Although when the world fought First World War, Second World War, there was the role of women and women got affected because of these wars. But this discipline completely ignored their role. But after the end of the Second World War, with the emergence of new issues, new challenges, the things that were earlier getting ignored we are coming into vogue and this necessitated the alternative approaches to international relations and that gave rise to feminist perspective. So feminist perspective in international relations emerged from third debate. The first debate was between realism and liberalism, neorealism, neoliberalism and then with the third debate between positivist and post-positivist scholars, the theory of feminism emerged and with its emergence, it is considered as one of the key theories of international relations because it sheds light on the role of women. It brings light on the problem that women face, their reality, their position, their perspective on the issues. Okay, inter-state relations can also have the perspective of women. So, feminism started viewing the international relations through gender lens that was earlier being ignored because there was masculine biasness and feminism recognizes that masculine biasness. So if we talk about social constructivism that I just discussed, what does social constructivism say? That nothing is pre-given everything is constructed. So it was being constructed that females has or women has nothing to do with international relations. So this biasness was created, it was constructed. If we define feminism, the first thing that can be said is that there is no single definition of feminism. But feminism points out many things that has been ignored. 
First, it is concerned with equality and justice and the elimination of women's subordination and operation. So, if we define it broadly, it can be said that it is a movement for social advancement of women. And there are two central beliefs. What is that? First, women are disadvanced because of their sex. And this disadvantage can and should be overthrown. Now, I would like to talk about this term. There are two terms, gender and sex. Sex is a biological concept, but gender is a social concept. This is natural. So, feminist has not questioned this, but this gender has been socially constructed that is why feminist has questioned the concept of gender. And they are saying that women have been at disadvantageous position because of their sex. Despite the fact that nature has not discriminated because nature has given certain roles to male and certain roles to female. But society has made different norms for male and different norms for female. And through that norm, the society is putting the women at disadvantageous position. That is the reason that women or families say that this disadvantage should be overthrown. And families challenge the masculine assumption of human nature because they opine that or as per their view, masculine perspective has neglected the social reproduction and development as integral aspects of human nature. They have neglected the role that women has to pay and that play and that is the role of reproduction. And that is the reason that feminism says that all human beings, regardless of their sex, process the genetic inheritance. We both have the some qualities of our mother and some qualities of our father. So, we both are the blend of both female and male attributes and tra traits. So, we can't say that one is more important than other. And that is the main quest of feminism. They say that women and men should not be judged on the basis of their sex, but they should be judged as individuals or as persons, as individuals they should be judged on the basis of their capacity, on the basis of their intelligence, on the basis of their perspective, not on the basis of their sex. So, in this view a very clear distinction can be drawn between sex and gender that I already explained you just now. So, feminists basically view that global order, order is socially constructed and this social constructivism incorporates within itself hierarchy and through this hierarchy females are getting a subordinate position. This is perpetuating gender subordination. And that is the reason that feminists criticize the marginalization of women in conflict. 
women experience in war, conflict, diplomacy have got marginalized. So, feminists argue that women's perspective, their role, their voices, their knowledge, their experience is often overlooked or subsumed because we usually see that, we usually believe that this whole field of international relations is basically male centric universal experience. It depends upon the experience of the male, it depends upon the decision of the male and women has been eliminated. So, feminists want to have a gender lens for viewing the global politics and that is the reason that feminist theories have been widely applied to the study of international and global politics since late 1980s, since the time that this theory has came into vogue. But their arrival in this field has been late as compared to the other streams because feminism has been affecting the other areas of social science much before 1980s. But its importance in the field of international relations got recognized in the late 1980s. Thus, feminism has made a significant contribution in the so called fourth debate of international relations. Because feminism when they got incorporated in the field of international relations, they were incorporated through empirical and analytical feminism. Now, what is empirical feminism? Empirical feminism basically concerned with adding women to existing analytical framework. That means, make them visible, add women. And analytical feminism by contrast is concerned with highlighting the gender biasness. The gender biasness that is existing, they basically want to highlight that. And that is the reason that it is analytical in nature. Now, coming to the prominent scholars of the theory of feminism. Cynthia Inloy, her very famous book, Bananas, Beaches and Bases, Making Feminist Sense of International Politics. In this book, Cynthia Inloy has raised the question, where are women? Because when she analyzed the field of international relations, she found that there is no women. Although society is made up of men and women both, but this field has been male centric. So, Cynthia Enloy highlights the subordinate roles given to the women by the states. For example, they are working as banana plantation owned by MNCs, wives of diplomats, hosting dinners, sex workers at military bases. Although they are contributing in international relations by doing this work, but when we see the role played by men and role played by women, their work is of subordinate position. Why? Because this field is considered as an exclusive zone for males, where women have, it is popularly believed that women has no role to play in this field. And then Cynthia in Loy concludes that personal is international and international is personal. Whatever is personal is having an equal impact on international and whatever international things are happening, they are affecting the personal life of women. In the same way that 
personal is political. That is a very famous quote in the second wave of feminism that is called radical feminism. So, Cynthia in law says that personal is international. So, there are many things that women are performing in personal life, for example, being the wife of diplomat. Suppose in conflict a woman loses her husband, loses her son, loses her brother, that will impact her personal life. Then Carol Cohen, her article, Sex and Death. This article suggests that there is exclusive masculine culture and this culture is responsible for the divorce of war from human emotions. So, what does this masculine culture says? That war has nothing to do with human emotions. So, as women are considered more emotional, so they have nothing to do with, do with this war. Then J. B. Elstein in her book Women and War, she also opines that feminist perspective aims to create sensitivity about the consequences of masculine discourses which promote distorted world view. What does that mean? It means that feminism, this whole theory of feminism, this whole movement of feminism has made certain contribution, has made a significant contribution and that is to create sensitivity. About what? About the consequences of masculine discourse. That if we see the happenings of international politics from the masculine perspective, we are missing a major portion because women comprise the half of the section of the world population. So, we are only analyzing, we are only viewing the half of the things. And this is what? This is the distorted world view because it is not the complete picture, it is the half picture. Jane Tickner, she has also contributed significantly in the field, in this field and her book Gender in International Relations, Feminist Perspective on Achieving Global Security. It got published in 1988 and in her book, J. N. Tickner reformulated the six principles given by Morgenthau. The first one is that when Morgenthau says that objective laws of human nature. So, J. N. Tickner says that the description of human nature by Morgenthau is culturally defined because hum, when we talk about human, it can be both male as well as female. So, human nature is both masculine as well as feminine. So, when Morgenthau says that politics is governed by objective laws that have its roots in human nature. He has in mind the masculine perspective. He does not say that okay, both male and female. Human nature comprises both male and female. Human nature for Morgenthau means only the nature of male. So, Jane Tickner reformulate this principle of Morgenthau and she says that when you talk about human nature, you should include both masculine as well as feminine perspective. Next, he says that national interest defined in terms of power, but Jane Tickner says that national interest cannot be defined 
only in terms of power okay power can be one of the factor but there are other factors also and we have to take a multi dimensional view so when morgenthau says that there is conflict everywhere but jane tigner says that international politics also involve cooperation we can't be in a permanent state of war we need peace also we need cooperation also and the third that power cannot be defined only in the masculine sense of domination power can also be seen in constructive sense of empowerment so for the as morgenthau says that nation should all, always strive for more and more power and what does that power do that power will, will create more instability so tigner says that power if viewed from masculine sense of domination it will lead to insecurity instability we should see the power from constructive sense of empowerment power can be used to empower someone so then when morgenthau says that politics need to be separated from ethics tigner says that politics cannot be separated from ethics because every political action has some moral significance so if we will take moral principles into account we can avoid war and if we will resort to immorality it will create a nervous state of affair where it will be very difficult for us to come out of that nervous state of affair so there is a need to take moral principles into account so that we can avoid war because war is not good for anyone when morgenthau says that ethics carry no meaning tigner says that we cannot say that ethics carry no meaning because human race cannot survive without ethics we cannot absolve politicians from taking the moral responsibility of their action we should make them responsible to take the moral responsibility if we will say that morality and politics has nothing to do it will create an immoral world where it will be very difficult for us to survive she also reject the autonomy of politics from ethics because it is an extremely narrow view of politics now coming to the women's participation in war and conflict in international con conflict whenever we talk about any conflict women are portrayed as vulnerable they need protection but this perspective is marginalizing them because through this perspective we are marginalizing them to participate in any kind of discussion and processes of war because it is a masculine perspective there is a masculinization of the sphere of war and conflict where women are completely invisible what cynthia inlow said is that where are women so in spite of their active role during war and conflict because they are taking care of the wounded persons becoming prostitutes to support their war torn families their role is completely neglected in war and conflict and even when we talk about the discourse of protection there is exclusive targeting a target of women through rape and sexual violence and this rape and sexual violence is seen as an effect of war but it is a key military strategy used for nations for ethnic cleansing and genocide this perspective is getting ignored in this masculine perspective so feminism wants to shed light on this issue that even 
if women is suffering for uh, through rape and sexual violence because of this conflict it is a one of the key military strategy used by nations for ethnic cleansing and genocide so we need to be thoughtful of this now what is the relevance of feminist approach how feminism is relevant first is feminism made us realize the gender inequality that is that was present in the discourse of international relations they highlighted the need to address gender disparities by challenging the traditional power structure because this traditional power structure is ultimately perpetuating inequality in the society they are also shedding light on how gender shapes the global politics by including the issues such as security development human rights through this issues feminism is bringing the role of the gender in shaping the global politics then the issue of peace and security feminist scholars and the activists they have challenged the traditional notion of security and broadened the concept of non traditional concept of security that in which human security is also included the traditional concept of security is focused on the protection of the boundaries of the nations where women has nothing to do but when we talk about the non traditional concept of security which is more prevalent nowadays since the end of the cold war so their women has very important role to play and this non traditional concept of security has broadened the concept of security because this non traditional concept of security has encompassed the new challenges that the world is facing now it also encompasses the well being and rights of individuals and communities so feminism has highlighted the disproportionate impact of conflict on women and how what and what can be done for that so feminism has advocated women's inclusion in peace process include women in that because they are also the sufferers it is not exclusively the male that is suffering because of conflict and they have also emphasized the importance of addressing gender based violence as a security issue because personal is political then the issue of global governance so feminist approach to international relations challenges the male centric nature of global governance and institutions the global governance and institutions has always seen the world through masculine perspective and feminism calls for greater gender equality in decision making bodies because all these decision making bodies are dominated by males so there need to include females also because the inclusion of females and women's perspective will shape global policies and agendas that will be more based on equality they also push for the recognition of care work and redistribution of resources and power in a more equitable way then there is also one more concept and that is the transnational feminism so feminist approach to international relations recognizes the importance of transnational feminist network and movement and they acknowledge the interconnectedness of women's struggle that has been global that has led to collective action 
action and that have addressed the common challenge. It highlights the significance of cross border solidarity and cooperation for in promoting gender equality and social justice. So, in conclusion it can be said that while feminist international relations theory have gained traction as their role is getting bigger and bigger. So, we can be optimistic in the sense that feminist theory can also have a bigger role to play because they have much more potential in analyzing the problems of the world and providing solution to them. So, this is about the feminism in international relations. So, in this lecture I covered the concept of social constructivism and feminism in international relations. Thank you. Hello and welcome to this piece of literary snippet. Perhaps the most popular literary genre after novel is the short story. Sharp, compact narratives whose charm lies not only in what is said, but also in what remains unsaid. Today I will be reading one of the shortest instances of a short story that I have ever encountered. And Indeed, the very charm of this particular story that I am going to read out today lies in the way it abruptly ends. It is an ancient tale from Mesopotamia which has been retold by several authors among whom the name of Somerset Mom stands out. Uh, the adaptation that I will be reading out is perhaps the closest to the one that Mom wrote. The story is titled in all of its adaptations almost as Appointment in Samara. Here is the story. A merchant in Baghdad once sent one of his servants to the market. The servant was supposed to buy provisions for the merchant, but when he returned, he came back empty handed. Indeed, the servant had all gone wiet and trembling with fear, he told his master that he had met death in the marketplace. When I entered the market, the servant said to his master, I was jostled by a woman and when I turned to look at her, I saw that she was death. I am very scared, master, because death looked at me with a threatening gesture. Can you please lend me your horse so that I can fly away from Baghdad to the town of Samara and thereby escape death? The master, being a good man, gave his servant his best horse and saw him gallop off to Samara to escape death. Then the master himself went to the marketplace and confronted death. Why did you make a threatening gesture to my servant? Asked the master to death. And death replied, it was not a threatening gesture. Rather, it was a start of surprise. I was astonished to see your servant here today because this evening, I have an appointment with him in Samara. See you in the next episode of Literary Snippet. <laughs>